Oh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's John Heiblish. I have the honor of being executive director of the Reagan Presidential Foundation. And it's, uh, it's great to have you all with us this evening. In honor of our men and women who serve our country and protect our freedoms around the globe every day, if you would please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, please be seated. Well, it is a real pleasure to be here to introduce two of our nation's best and brightest when it comes to journalism and politics, Fred Barnes and Mort Kondracki. And it is especially great to see them at the Reagan Library on the heels of the release of such an outstanding book about Jack Kemp. Uh, for those in the audience who are real Reagan fans, you know that former congressman and vice presidential candidate Jack Kemp occupies much, much more than the footnote that history has thus far afford it for his role in the Reagan Revolution of the 1980s. Fred and Mort spoke about Jack, the man who gave life to the term bleeding heart conservative, brings to light, as no book uh, has done before, the importance of the role that Congressman Jack Kemp played during the Reagan era. It is true that he quite literally quarterbacked the Republican Party's supply side team that backed Reaganomics and brought our country decades of unprecedented economic growth. Having been a young staffer who worked for the House Budget Committee in support of Congressman Kemp during the Reagan years, I was particularly pleased to see our authors get it right. And what I mean by that is that I think they captured well the heart and soul of a man who was just a pleasure to watch in action. I don't think that I've ever had the opportunity to see a happy warrior as good as Jack Kemp in fighting for his beliefs both within his own party as well as those on the other side of the aisle. One might not have been in Jack's camp for every ideological battle every single day, but his spirit and his love for his country were so genuine that his enthusiasm was contagious to just about everyone he met. Now, whether you know our authors here today from their work on the Beltway Boys, the McLaughlin Group, Fox News, the Weekly Standard, the New Republic, and the numerous other publications that they've served, both are eminently qualified to have written this book. Jack Kemp may have passed away a few years ago, but having experienced some of the joy that he brought to politics, I have no doubt in my mind that he would have chosen Fred and Mort to write this biography. They, like Jack Kemp, have made huge contributions to their field, educating, informing, and entertaining all of us from the time that Congressman Jack Kemp of Buffalo, New York, was a young backbencher in Congress to this very day. It's just an honor to have him here. So if you would, please join me in welcoming to the Reagan Library Mr. Fred Barnes and Mr. Mort Kondracki. Thank you. That's very good, John. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Mort. He's Fred. <laughs> um, well, you all are very lucky to live here and uh, have the opportunity of visiting this gorgeous place. Um, uh, I, this is my first, my first visit here. Fred's been here three times before. Uh, but it was, it, it's, a, it's, it's a, uh, the whole, this whole experience has been a, um, a reliving of our journalistic careers and we're delighted for it. So, and of course, any of you who ever watched the McLaughlin Group uh, will know that we're not only glad to be here, we're glad to be anywhere where we can finish a sentence uh, without, <laughs> without getting interrupted. 
Um, at lunch today, uh, Fred and I were, um, were sort of reminiscing about the time that he and I had lunch with Ronald Reagan. Uh, and the third guest at lunch was Paul Harvey. And uh, so, so Fred and I are eager beaver reporters, and we're determined to ask heavy policy questions to get Reagan to talk about what he's going to do about this and that. I can't remember what we were, because we didn't get anything, right? Yeah. So all Reagan wanted to do was, was shoot the breeze with Paul Harvey and tell old, old jokes. And um, there's, Fred reminds me that, there was a, that there's a picture of this with the foot of Edmund Morris in the, in the shot. And Edmund Morris, of course, was totally flummoxed by, by, by Ronald Reagan. He, he couldn't get it straight how this guy did, did he, what he did. Well, my opportunity in researching the Kemp book was to read the Reagan diaries, read the Reagan autobiography, read lots of books about, about the Reagan presidency. And what comes through is how smart this guy was, how visionary he was. And so the, 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 the process of writing this book has become as much an appreciation of Ronald Reagan as it, as it is of, uh, of Jack Kemp. Um, so anyway, so there are four reasons why we've, uh, re we've written this book. <clears throat> the first is encompassed in the very first sentence of the book, which we thought was going to be intensely controversial. And um, it's hardly raised uh, uh, anybody's eyebrows. <clears throat> the, the first sentence of the book is, and I'll let Fred explain why we say this. Uh, the first sentence is, <clears throat> um, Jack Kemp was the most important politician of the 20th century who was not president, certainly the most influential Republican. And um, I will let, let, let Fred, Fred explain what, that, what, what that's all about. But the second reason is that he lived an interesting life. The third reason that we wrote it is that we, this was an opportunity for us to relive our journalistic experience. And the fourth reason, which I think is the most important reason, which we'll get to, is that we think America is in trouble in a way at least as serious, ways at least as serious as it was in the 1970s, and that we need a resurgence of the camp spirit in our leadership um, in order to overcome these problems. Anyway, Fred. And we may get it with uh, Paul Ryan, who was an acolyte of uh, Jack Kemp, uh, sat outside uh, his door uh, as his top assistant when Kemp and Bill Bennett and Gene Kirkpatrick founded the, uh, the think tank called Empower America. Uh, and now, uh, a couple days ago, Paul Ryan announced that as speaker, I'm assuming he will be elected speaker on Thursday uh, of this week, he will have uh, um, Dave going? Hoppe. Yeah, Dave Hoppe. I know him well. <laughs> the uh, names, uh, Dave Hoppe uh, as his chief of staff. Well, Dave Hoppe was Jack Kemp's chief of staff uh, for a number of years. So the, uh, the uh, certainly the Kemp legacy lives. If there is a Kemp legacy, that means the Reagan legacy is a a, a big part of it. I always say to people that if they people who question how smart Reagan was. I say, read the diaries. That's all you have to do, read the diaries. They're long, but they're really worth reading. I mean, you find out things you just, you were, some things you, you knew were true, uh, like how devoted Ronald Reagan was to Nancy, but you just didn't know how devoted he was <laughs> to Nancy. I mean, it really was, it's really extraordinary. When you read about it, she'd be away for one day and he'd, he'd be down in the dumps <laughs> yeah, because of that. Anyway. Why was, uh, why was Jack Kemp uh, the most important politician in America and probably the world in the 20th century who wasn't president? And the real reason was what Kemp did uh, to produce uh, the tax cut championed by Reagan, the supply side tax cut of cutting uh, across the board income tax rates uh, that uh, created a quarter century of prosperity in America being frittered away now, as I'm sure you've noticed. But uh, it was this uh, a tax cut uh, that really grew out of this movement that Kemp created, this former football player, uh, the, uh, uh, in the 1970s. It was just a remarkable achievement. 
you know, Morton, I, well, I'm not sure whether Morton wanted this. One of the words I wanted in the, in the title of the book was quarterback. And unfortunately, uh, I lost that argument. <laughs> I, I was in favor of it, too. I, but yeah, the, the, pub uh, the, the, the publishers <laughs> thought that, the, that everybody th would think that this was just a football book. So. Yeah. <laughs> but Jack was a quarterback uh, with the Buffalo Bills. He was in college. He was as a professional football player. And he became a quarterback uh, when he was in Congress, too. Didn't happen immediately. Uh, uh, but then at that, he put together, after he was elected in Buffalo, you know, he retired from football. Uh, a year later, he's elected to Congress in 1970. And the first thing he wanted to do was uh, help Buffalo. Already the Rust Belt had started to become the Rust Belt with factories uh, uh, closing down and high employment going up. And so he, he uh, hired a man named uh, Randy Teague, who'd, who'd worked on tax policy in the Nixon uh, White House, and he came up with a few tax bills that didn't get anywhere, uh, but, what, uh, but things that he hoped would, uh, if they were enacted, would uh, help rejuvenate Buffalo, New York. Uh, and then finally, uh, under the, uh, the influence of an editorial writer for the Wall Street Journal named uh, Jude Winiski, Kemp embraced supply-side economics. Uh, he, and anything that Jack Kemp embraced, he became a, a, an incredible promoter of. He believed in. He evangelized. And he was very good at it. You have to remember that Jack Kemp was a remarkably dynamic figure. Uh, if you would see him now among the group of Republicans, and I like a number of them, uh, who we'll see on, on, on Wednesday night in a Republican presidential debate, Jack was just more vibrant and lively and, and, uh, uh, and really dynamic than the rest of them. He put together a movement. Now, this is a backbencher. This guy, he wasn't on the House Ways and Means Committee. He held no job uh, in, the, in the leadership of the Republican Party. Uh, and yet he put together this group that included, uh, I think, really three parts. Uh, there was sort of the New York part with uh, uh, Robert Mundell, one of the economists who really created uh, supply-side economics. Uh, and Art Laffer, and importantly, the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. And then in Washington, he put together a group of members of Congress in particular, and some th staff economists as well, but young, the smartest young members of Congress who are Republicans. Newt Gingrich was elected in 1978, immediately became a follower of, of Jack Kemp. Connie Mack from Florida, Dan Lundgren from California, uh, Dan Coates from Indiana, and you can go on in the list. When these smart young members of Congress came, they just naturally uh, migrated toward Jack Kemp and became followers. Uh, the Kemp tax cut, 30% uh, across the board, never, was, never won a vote in the House of Representatives, and yet Jack Kemp came pushing it and pushing it. Uh, so you had the New York side, you had the Washington side, and then, of course, the third part of it was Ronald Reagan. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was always for cutting taxes. But the, Kemp's role was to sell uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, still a candidate in 1980, uh, on, the, on this particular type of tax cut, across the board, cutting tax rates that would uh, provide incentives for people to uh, work and save and invest, uh, and, and, and what makes Kemp so important was not only did he, this was his bill, remember it was called the, uh, the, the Kemp Roth bill, a senator from Delaware, Bill Roth was his uh, co-sponsor. What makes it so important is that it worked. It worked marvelously. It became, it was a big part of Reaganomics. Now there were other parts too, things Reagan did, regulatory reform and so on, uh, but it was the biggest part. There was a lot of opposition to it. There was a lot of opposition to it in the White House staff, uh, among Republican members of Congress. Ronald Reagan didn't flinch. Uh, and the tax cut passed as a 25% across the board tax cut. And we know what happened to America as a result. You know, I used to drive out of, the, the way I could tell you, it was really tangible. Because if you drive out to Dulles Airport, as I do uh, frequently, even back then, you saw in the early 80s, there were a number of buildings that you could look through. Uh, and the breeze was blowing through them because they had, uh, it, because there was a, a, a deep recession in 79 and 80 and then again in 81, uh, and they just stopped building them. 
a couple of years later, after the Reagan tax cuts, construction was there again. Uh, and of course, you see now, you drive out to Dulles Airport, and it's wall-to-wall -wall office buildings, big ones on both sides of the road. Uh, but what really brought them back uh, was Reaganomics. Uh, and I think it's safe to say that Ronald Reagan would have been for some tax cuts, but uh, the particular ones that worked so well that became Reaganomics, there was really without Jack Kemp, you wouldn't have had that. And that's why Kemp uh, was so important. Uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll let more tell you about the really uh, three parts, uh, three, well, two big parts of Kemp that I think are interesting we write about in the book. One is the one I've talked about, Kemp, uh, the guy with a big idea, and Kemp was a big idea guy. Uh, Newt Gingrich says, I think importantly, that Kemp was not even a man of the House of Representatives. Kemp was a presidential type figure. He didn't care about, he really didn't care whether Republicans controlled uh, the House or not, uh, because he was going to push his ideas uh, regardless. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, the biggest uh, reason about Kemp. But I'll let more talk about Kemp, the model Republican leader and politician. Well, <clears throat> let me just let me just finish out the the uh, the, the, the first reason. So I thought I, Rick, I, thought I was you, you did a very good job. <laughs> you always you always do. Um, so I, I mean, no people forget what the 1970s were like. Um, what a, you know, the era of stagflation, of malaise, of gas lines, of uh, Iran hostages, and of, uh, geopolitical advances everywhere elsewhere in the world. The Soviets were in Afghanistan, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Kemp, with, uh, Kemp and Reagan do the supply side tax cuts. They also did the tax reform of 1986. So the, the top rate was 70% in 1980, came down to 50% in 1981, then came down to 28% in uh, 1986 and set off this great explosion of prosperity. But it, it had other effects. It, um, it, uh, it, it convinced the world that democratic capitalism was the way to go. Um, it gave uh, the United States the revenue, the wherewithal, to, to uh, afford uh, Reagan's huge defense buildup, which, along with the example of the success of the American economy, weakened the spirit and the, the, and the resolve of the Soviet Union, which collapsed shortly after Reagan, Reagan left office. And it completely restored American morale. I mean, in 1980, only 13% of the American people thought that the country was headed in the right direction. In, in, in 1986, it was 69%. Uh, and so Reagan was the guy who did it, but he used the, the intellectual uh, capital that, that, uh, that Jack had provided. First, Kemp Roth, then, then, um, uh, then tax reform. So, <clears throat> so what, what the, we're back in the same kind of, not exactly the same kind of situation, but we're back in a, in a period of, gl of glacial growth, of flat median incomes, of, of uh, down morale. 30% of the American people think that, that America's headed in the right direction. Um, and Kemp always said that in a period of stagnation, that politics becomes the, the process of pitting one group against another for political advantage. Uh, black against white, poor, rich against poor, north against south, Rust Belt against Sun Belt, et cetera, et cetera. And what do we have now? We have people pitting the 1% against the 47%. Um, Donald Trump is blaming Mexicans for all of our problems. Uh, Republicans are blaming uh, Barack Obama. Uh, Democrats are blaming the, um, the failure of, uh, of uh, Congress to pass the Obama program. Everybody's pointing fingers at one another, and nothing is getting done. And the, uh, the country is furious with Washington, as well it should be, for, for uh, ineptitude. And people want things shaken up. <clears throat> now, Jack Kemp shook things up but he shook things up with ideas. He said that the purpose of a political party is not only to win elections, but to deserve to win elections by producing ideas that will make life better for ordinary Americans. 
And unfortunately, um, we have too few ideas and too few people working together to get the ideas accomplished. Um, and um, uh, what we need is a resurgence of, of, of the Kemp spirit. Kemp was idealistic. He was optimistic. He was growth oriented. Growth was his economic growth was his favorite idea. Um, and supply side economics was based on the, the notion that if you lowered tax rates, it would incentivize people to work harder, to invest, to save, and the result of it would be a booming economy. That would, and he believed in the Kennedy maxim, a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, he was inclusive. He wanted uh, the Republican Party to be the party of Abraham Lincoln again, um, in the sense that he was pro-civil rights, but he was also in favor of the government's helping people who were stuck on the bottom. He, he came to believe that although a rising tide lifts all boats, some boats are stuck on the bottom and need government help to, to lift them. Uh, and that's, that was enterprise zones and welfare reform and uh, education choice and that sort of thing. And what we desperately need, in, in, and I think Paul Ryan, Fred is right, Paul Ryan is the, is the, um, the resurrection, if you like, of, uh, of the camp spirit. But we need it in a presidential candidate, and we'll get into that as to which presidential candidates mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> might be models for, uh, for the future. I, would, Fred. I want to say one thing. We are going to uh, turn you all for questions if you don't have any, and then we can all get up and leave. But, uh, <laughs> but my favorite story in the book um, is about Jack Kemp at the 1980 Republican Convention in Detroit. Both Mort and I were there. And <clears throat> Jack Kemp was scheduled on the second day of the convention to give a speech on prime time. Prime time at conventions is 10 to 11 at the p.m. And his speech was going to be right in the middle uh, in prime time following Barry Goldwater and Jack Kemp. And finishing that uh, prime time slot would be Henry Kissinger. Pretty good slot for Kemp to be in. No question about that. And his aides had planned a big demonstration on the floor, you know, marching around and making a lot of noise and, and with a lot of placards saying Kemp for vice president and so on. So there Kemp's waiting to speak uh, at, that night. And Barry Goldwater talks and talks and talks <laughs> and talks, going way over his limit. And Mike Deaver, of course, who worked for uh, Ronald Reagan for many years, and he was really in charge of uh, things that went on at the convention, calls down to the stage uh, and, and tells them that, uh, well, we're going to have to tell Camp, we'll have to cancel Camp because we've got to get Henry Kissinger on in prime time. And this is kind of tough on Camp, but he accepts it. And, and, you know, his uh, followers were really upset, and he tells them, you know, look, I mean, I'll, they promised me I'll speak tomorrow night, and, and don't worry about it. And Kemp goes off into the crowd. Uh, and, and, and so the, uh, the woman who actually did the announcements was about to announce Henry Kissinger. But there was one other person involved here, and this was a young congressman from Delaware, a Republican named Tommy Evans. I happen to know him. Did you ever know Tommy Evans? I knew him. And, uh, and he had one thing, one thing he felt very strong about. He loved Jack Kemp. He was a big supporter of Jack Kemp. Uh, and so Tommy Evans, uh, when, he, when the word comes down, he's standing right there by uh, the young woman who does the announcements, and he tells her, introduce Kemp. Introduce Kemp. And she doesn't want to do it. He says, do it. Do it. And so... <laughs> One of the guy who told us this uh, story is a, a friend of ours named David Smick, who was Kemp's chief of staff, and he says, all of a sudden, while Kemp is gone, they don't know where he is, uh, he hears the announcement, that, and, and, the, uh, and this young woman is announcing uh, uh, the next speaker saying, and he was a quarterback for the San Diego Chargers. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it wasn't Kissinger that she was introducing. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, and so... Uh, uh, Dave Smick, this, uh, Kemp's chief of staff, says, they're introducing Jack Kemp. Where is he? Can't find him. Finally, he's, he's looking out in the crowd and, and so on, and he finally sees Kemp's head of hair. 
<laughs> sticking up, and he goes out and drags him up to the stage, and Kemp goes up. His speech is on the teleprompter, and he, he reads about two sentences and then just wings it for the rest of the way, the speech of his career. He, obviously, he talked about, about cutting taxes and economic growth before. Uh, a, a fantastic speech, and they have this great demonstration on the floor. Uh, and I've always thought about it as, you know, one of my, uh, the big hero, uh, the heroes of our book are really uh, uh, Jack Kemp and Ronald Reagan. But then there's Tommy Evans. <laughs> what a great guy. <laughs> what Tommy Evans did there it reminded me there is a God. <laughs> anyway, it's my favorite story in the book. But there are a lot of them in there. Mort did, uh, when he was doing a, a, uh, uh, a yeah, what you call it, he had oral he had an oral history of Jack Kemp, uh, did a hundred or more interviews, all of which the transcripts I've read, uh, included some great stories. And, and anecdotes, and as and he as he did as uh, Mort said, the second reason why we wrote the book is Kemp had such an extraordinary, interesting, and thrilling career uh, in football and politics, and me, uh, me, remarkable let guy. Tell, let me tell. So my favorite story is in the in the book is is uh, about when Jack Kemp was a was a quarterback for the San Diego Chargers uh, in a preseason game. Um, he's throwing a pass. And as he's finishing the pass, he knocks his, the ring finger of his uh, passing uh, hand t uh, on the helmet of an onrushing tackler. And uh, he plays the rest of the game, and he dislocated his knuckle. And during the rest of the game, he pulls his knuckle back into shape, into, into, into place, and keeps on playing. Wouldn't, wouldn't leave the field. This is a preseason game. He didn't, you know, he didn't need to do that, but that's the kind of guy he was. So he, so it, the injury was so bad that the knuckle had to be fused. So the doctor said, how would you like the knuckle to be fused? He said, get me a football. So they get a football, and he fuses, he fuses this knuckle in the, in the shape of a football, and forever after, I can't do this, right, you shake Kemp's hand, and this finger is sticking out in the shape of a football. Now, this is emblematic of the kind of person that Jack Kemp was. Jack Kemp decided at the age of five that he wanted to be Bob Waterfield, uh, the L.A. Rams uh, Hall of Fame quarterback who was a passing quarterback. And uh, Kemp went, was, played for Fairfax High School in, in L.A. And he was okay, uh, but he wasn't big enough to go to USC or UCLA, so he went to Occidental. Um, he did not start. As a, as a quarterback for Occidental until his junior year, although the first pass he threw was a 60-yard touchdown pass. But, you know, and he had, a, he had a good career, but he was little college All-American third team, right? So he is determined that he's going to be a pro football quarterback. And he somehow got into the NFL draft, was drafted number 253, uh, in, in the year's draft and got signed by the, by the uh, Detroit Lions, cut the Lions. Fascinating. You go at the beginning of the Reagan exhibit, there's, a, there's some descriptions of what Ronald Reagan's mother told him about what it took to succeed in life. It's almost word for word, and I, they were not Christian scientists, they were Presbyterians, I guess, disciples of Christ or whatever, whatever they were. But the, one of the tenets of Christian science is that anything you believe you can do, you can do. And one door, if one door closes, another always opens. And this, and this creates this sense of <coughs> optimism, almost unworldly optimism that Kemp had. And sure enough, the door that closed, the NFL, another door opened called the American Football League, and Kemp was a grand success in the American Football League. And uh, not only was he a success, I mean, it's interesting, Ronald Reagan was the president of the Screen Actors Guild. Jack Kemp was the president of the, uh, of the American Football League Players Association. They were both union guys. Kemp believed that, that uh, 
uh, uh, collective bargaining was a basic human right, unlike a lot of a lot of Republicans. He discovered racial segregation as a football player, and he understood that it didn't make any difference what color uh, a lineman was. Either the lineman kept him protected, or it didn't. It didn't make any difference whether a halfback was black or white. Could he carry the ball? Could uh, could he catch a pass? You know, and so on. Uh, and Kemp became um, totally colorblind. In fact, more than colorblind, and decided that that, for example, in the 1964 um, uh, AFL All Star Game was uh, staged and supposed to be staged in New Orleans. Um, uh, the black players were forbidden to go into certain restaurants, weren't allowed to ride in, in whites-only taxi cabs, and the black players decided to boycott the game, and Jack Kemp stood with them. And, you know, that's part of why, why his football experience is why he wanted the Republican Party to be the party of Lincoln again. And he honestly believed, although it's pretty fanciful, that if economic growth produced prosperity, and, and a rising tide lifted all boats, that African Americans would return to the Republican Party, which they had been, you know, they had been Republicans from Lincoln to Roosevelt, that he could bring them, that this prosperity could bring them back. Now this was powerful, but he also was in favor of comprehensive immigration reform. He campaigned in, in barrios as well as ghettos. Uh, he got himself into a lot of trouble in 1996 for, for opposing Proposition 187 here in California. Um, nowadays, when half of the Republican candidates want to deport illegal immigrants, Kemp would have been absolutely against that. He was the absolute antithesis of Donald Trump in every way except high energy and tax reform, uh, but, but insofar as blaming and insulting and calling people names and all of that stuff, Kemp would have none of it. Um, so that, that's the spirit that needs to be restored, and um, I, we can get into what can, candidates might restore it and what and might not. Should we open it? Yeah, to no, it, it, okay. it, uh, to, uh, correct me. <clears throat> it's only one presidential candidate, Republican presidential candidate, who wants to deport. Uh, you know, I beg immigrants. your pardon. Ted Cruz does. No, he doesn't. Oh he, yes, no, he, he does. does. No, he Please doesn't. go. Come on. <laughs> you're, you're just wrong. They all. They all. No, they don't. They yes, don't. They do. I, yes, I, they do. <laughs> right, Bobby gentlemen. Jindal? Yes, he does. No, he doesn't. Um, they want to self-deport them. Well, Fred anyway, and Mark have ahead. been nice enough to take questions. I'm just here to organize it. Um, so if you do have a question, raise your hand. We have two people here with microphones, and we just ask that you get the mic in your hand before you speak because you're on television. We want to make sure people uh -huh. hear uh -huh. uh, what you We'll start right over here We're to my left. To television. You just had an example of the Beltway Boys, by the way, in action. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. My, uh, my prayers uh, have been and are with you guys. And uh, as a secondary book, I recommend Rebel in Chief by Fred Barnes. Ah, about, thank uh, you, President thank George you. W. Bush. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, could you please uh, talk about, Britt Hume made a great statement of when Kemp passed about that he, he really made peace with the Lord, not Christian science this way, but biblical Christian, you know, Christianity, Jesus. You know, he made peace with him before he died. Can you speak mm -hmm. on that? And also, uh, are there some similarities you see with President George W. Bush and Kemp in the sense that I wonder if even President Bush looked at that op optimism that came more through Kemp than even, you know, some other people that he knew. Um, and also, uh, you know, the immigration thing, but also, uh, you know, tax reform and, uh, and even, you know, both were criticized for being big government Republicans, but Bush's uh, deficit to the economy was less than Reagan's and Clinton's. So uh, speak on those things, please. Yeah, Thanks. which one you want to take? No, you, you start. Okay. The, uh, You're the George W. Bush expert. <laughs> well, <coughs> well, they were alike. You know who he was uh, uh, more like, though, is uh, Jeb Bush. Uh, I don't know whether Jeb Bush would consider himself an acolyte of Jack Kemp, but he sure has emulated him in many, many ways. Uh, his tax program, for one, uh, uh, Jeb Bush is a, is a, a reform conservative. Uh, if you look at the tax program that he's put out uh, just as a candidate this year, 
would reduce the top rate to 28%, which is where the top rate on individual income, which is where Kemp and Ronald Reagan got it in 1986 uh, through tax reform, uh, and, in, and, and in many other ways, immigration, but many other issues. He's, he's very much like Kemp. I really hadn't, you know, to tell you the truth, I really hadn't thought of Kemp and George W. Bush. Uh, but, uh, but Jeb, I think the analogy works better with Jeb. Um, uh, Kemp's, uh, you know, as Mort said, Kemp uh, grew up a Christian scientist. He married an extremely evangelical uh, uh, woman, Joanne Kemp, who both Mort and I know very well, and uh, she has had for 30 plus years in Washington a Bible study every Friday uh, that my wife happens to go to. Uh, even though it's kind of a hike to go out to Bethesda, Maryland, we live in Virginia, <laughs> but, but uh, I mean, Joanne is really... She doesn't hike, she drives. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, she, Joanne had a powerful impact on her husband, uh, and he was a follower of Christ, no question about that, <laughs> but he did, he never fully gave up uh, Christian science. More, you know yeah, a little yeah. about that. Yeah, so, you know, he was, uh, he had these... Uh, I don't know what you'd call it, he would every once in a while return to Christian science. And it was actually uh, some, some kind of an issue in the, in, the, in the household sometimes. And during the, especially when he ran for president in 1988, um, somebody saw him you know, going into a Christian science reading room and he, was, would start, he started reading uh, Mary Baker Eddy again. And he, he, was, he was a member of Fourth Presbyterian Church he certainly died a, a, a Christian. Um, Christian scientists say they're Christians too, um, but he did ha he did have a, re a return every once in a while to Christian science. I would say one other thing. He opposed the Gulf War, George W. Bush's Gulf War, quite strenuously, and thought that if if we can do a preemptive strike against a country that we think might have weapons of mass destruction that would entitle anybody else who fears another country to hit him first and ask questions later. And he would argue with Dick Cheney, and would argue with Colin Powell, and would argue with Don Rumsfeld privately. He didn't really yell at him in public, but, uh, but he was definitely against that war. But when it came to the surge and when it came to winning and losing, he backed the surge. I mean, he was not in favor of losing the war. He was not in favor of going into it, however. Next question, we have another. Um, we'll go over here and then we'll come to you. With as great a man as you say Jack Kemp is, which I probably more sort of agree, why didn't Ronald Reagan have him as his vice president? Because, um, <clears throat> look, uh, Jack Kemp was a football player, Ronald Reagan was an actor. Uh, the two of them together would have lacked gravitas, seemingly, as a ticket, even though they were both incredibly smarter than they than the public and the press especially gave them credit for being. Um, and, and furthermore, George W. George w. Bush, rep, as a choice, represented a, 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 a tilt toward the moderate wing of the Republican Party. George W. Bush had run against uh, um, Ronald Reagan and finished second, basically. George H. W. Bush, sorry. Um, uh, Bush had been uh, ambassador to China, had been uh, UN ambassador, had been head of the CIA, had, get, had foreign policy credentials that Kemp didn't have, and Kemp was only a congressman. Uh, so that's basically the reason. It would have made a better ticket, and I believe it would have been better for America, because it would have been Kemp following eight years of Ronald Reagan rather than George H.W. Bush. I don't say this to denigrate George H.W. Bush, who I think was in many ways a great president, but Jack Kemp would have been a greater president. Uh, right over here. Would you share your opinion of President Obama? Would you discuss it <laughs> openly and freely? So, uh, so I have this, I have a friend who is the former chairman of the of the Democratic Party in the state of Maryland was the um, uh, was Howard Dean's finance chairman and is now um, um, what's what's the 
former governor of Maryland's name, uh, yeah, uh, O'Malley. Uh, Michael O'Ma O'Malley's treasurer, right? So he, he is quoting one of a distinguished black Democrat from Maryland who said to him, there are two kinds of people in America, the people who, are, who hate Barack Obama and the people who are disappointed in him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a black Democrat from Maryland mm -hmm. who says this. I am in the camp of those who is disappointed in him. I will confess I voted for Barack Obama the first time because the idea of having Sarah Palin one heartbeat away from the presidency was more than I could stomach. Um, and, and, and I sort of, like many people, looked at Barack Obama as a Rorschach test and listened to the stuff about uniting the country, red, red America and blue America, United States of America, believed all that stuff. Uh, so I'm so I'm deeply disappointed um, in his, especially in his failure to follow through on the notion of bipartisanship. Um, it took Barack Obama 18 months before he had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with um, Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader of the Senate. That is not the way a president governs. What the president does is he invites. Um, people up to Camp David, as Reagan did, schmoozes with them, um, argues with them, mixes with them, and, and, and leads them. Um, and so I'm disappointed. Well, some of us weren't uh, uh, taken in by what <laughs> Barack Obama said in 2008. Fred, Fred and, is uh, but a Mort, seer. But, what? but Mort makes a good point about, uh, about Obama and bipartisanship. Remember what his biggest argument was. His argument was, that he uniquely knew what would uh, change Washington, get rid of the polarization, he'd work with both parties and so on, and it went on and on about that. This was he, it wasn't that he was, uh, that he had a better record that he was campaigning on or that he had a better program. This was it. It was this insight that he said he had. It wasn't true. He didn't attempt to do that, and he particularly doesn't attempt now. I mean, he is, you know, Republicans get, get blamed for not, uh, uh, for not supporting Obama, for, not, for just rejecting all his policies and so on. You know, when was the last time, it hasn't been in recent years, uh, when is the last time that, that uh, Obama proposed a compromise on any issue with Republicans in Congress? I'm not sure he ever has. Uh, on any issue, certainly didn't on Obamacare, didn't on the on uh, any of the environmental issues. Doesn't uh, never has on a single issue. Republicans, at least in the beginning, they were frightened by Obama because he, uh, when he was elected, uh, would have agreed to uh, really small uh, gestures by uh, Obama to agree with him and make things uh, uh, bipartisan. There is a great value, as Mort was suggesting, to bipartisanship. On big issues, uh, if you want it to be, if you want them to be lasting, for the public to accept them, as they have Social Security and Medicare, all the civil rights legislation, uh, and so on, uh, they need to be bipartisan, as all as uh, uh, has always uh, uh, traditionally happened. Obama made uh, it didn't do that with anything, which is why Republicans are going to continue to try to. Uh, repeal Obamacare. Uh, about two-thirds of America, well, maybe that's high, 60 uh, percent of Americans don't accept the Iran nuclear deal as a good idea. It made no attempt to uh, get Republicans to vote for it. Uh, and on and on. And, uh, and all of these things uh, are not a surprise to me. Another question? I'll go over here and then we'll come back here. And then right there. Can we talk a little bit about the uh, Republican candidates? You had Ted Cruz spends a lot of his time knocking Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, Donald Trump spends most of his time insulting Republicans. <laughs> You've got um, Ben Carson that amazes me with some of his utterances. Do you find any normal Republican that you think can <laughs> not only get the nomination, but actually win the election? Well, I, 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 I have an idea of one. But yeah, yes, okay. who, who's your idea? I think Marco Rubio. Yeah, yeah I, I think there are, there, I think uh, there are elements of Kemp in Marco, in Marco Rubio. I th 
uh, Marco Rubio is one of those who has attempted to campaign in uh, among non-Republicans a little bit. Um, the only one, the only person who's not running is Paul Ryan, who has actually made an attempt to understand what the, the, the roots of poverty are in America and what can be done about it. Um, I don't see any of the Republican candidates particularly doing that. I think that Jeb Bush, as Fred said, is, is probably the closest. Um, you know, Rubio was, was the sponsor of a comprehensive immigration reform bill and then, and then uh, turned against it um, after it didn't pass. Um, so, you know, I'm skeptical about Marco Rubio, but, he, but he's, he's at least in the ballpark. I think John Kasich was in the ballpark talking about growth as the, as the number one uh, priority for America. And I, and I agree, what we've got to do is reignite the growth machine that is America in order to solve a lot of problems. And, but Kasich has decided to make a balanced budget the be all and the end all of his campaign and he is in favor of a constitutional amendment that would require a balanced budget every year. Now that strikes me as stupid economics. I mean in a recession uh, revenues always go down, unemployment benefits and other welfare goes up so you have an inherently unbalanced budget and what are you going to do? Raise taxes and cut spending during a recession? You're going to deepen the recession. So I'm, I've I've taken the Kasich bumper sticker off my car. <laughs> the only bumper sticker left is the Jeb Bush bumper sticker. You know, you pointed out about, uh, about uh, Trump and Cruz and attacking other Republicans, which they spend a lot of time doing. That was just not exactly what Kemp never did. I mean, Kemp uh, uh, saw opponents as potential converts. He certainly saw members of the press as potential converts. I mean, it's a, it's a completely different attitude that he had uh, in dealing with people. I mean, he was uh, an evangelist for uh, the ideas that he had, particularly uh, the idea that economic growth could solve so many of America's problems. And uh, uh, he, would, uh, he would not have fit in with uh, Ted Cruz and Donald Trump and uh, a few others that are, are running for president. In what way? You mean when? He would. I think. I think you'd have 1964 all over again. The Republican Party would get clobbered, and Hillary Clinton would be president. Yeah, I'm a, I, I agree. I agree with Mort on that, and uh, and there's a reason why, why that would happen. The, the question uh, was, what would happen? Yeah, what would happen if if uh, Donald Trump became president? Is so that got yeah. the nomination or got, became president? No. Uh, well, when the yeah became president is the question. Uh, I think he has an outside chance of winning the nomination. I think he has no chance of winning the presidency for the simple reason that uh, he has so, uh, such high negatives. He's alienated so many people. Uh, he's alienated a lot of Republicans uh, and the, uh, as well. Uh, he's got a hard core of, what, 25% or, uh, or more, but not much more. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it's not growing. It grew a lot more than uh, people thought it would, more than I thought it would, uh, but he sort of stuck there. And if you remember presidential primaries, what happens is they narrow down after a few events to a one-on-one -on -one race. You usually have a mainstream candidate that would not be Donald Trump and an outside candidate that would be Trump. And Trump would have a hard time winning the nomination uh, because, of the, because uh, you don't win it uh, with a quarter of the vote. I think he'd have a hard time expanding that. If he got in the general election, uh, he, his negatives would just uh, make it impossible for him to win. He's alienated minorities. He's alienated immigrant populations. He's alienated moderate Republicans anyway. Um, and, uh, and, and, and for that reason, I don't think he can win. He's fun to watch. No question about that. Uh, I mean, I've talked to him before. I spent time with him, and uh, he's, uh, he's quite a character. I went, about a year ago, I went to uh, New York with uh, Rick Perry, who was then the governor of Texas, and was thinking about running, and he was going around seeing people in New York, and I was writing a piece about him, so he took me everywhere with him, including in to see Donald Trump. And, 
And uh, uh, Trump is a character. You don't get a word in edgewise. That's the one way he's like Kemp. <laughs> he does all the talking, <laughs> as Kemp did. And so uh, Perry there is trying to get him to uh, uh, commit to support Perry, who has since dropped out of the Republican race, but to support him for president. And, and Trump indicates that, well, yeah, he might do that, or at the very least, he'd, uh, he'd send some money to Perry's campaign. So we're leaving after about an hour, and, uh, and Perry's gone on ahead, and, and Trump looks at me and said, come over here. He said, I'm probably going to run myself. <laughs> Perry left thinking he'd gotten Trump on his side. <laughs> Trump had other ideas, as, and, and he certainly followed through on them. Oh, uh, back here. On, yes, sir. Speaking of disappointment, uh, watching the Republicans, actually. Uh, there's not a lot of compromise going on in that department either. Uh, Jeb Bush, if I understood you correctly, might be the person that could kind of pull things together I think I got that from you. But he's about as exciting as Mitt Romney. Yeah. Maybe not quite. Low energy, <laughs> as they so, say. So <laughs> how do you, at least Trump, I think the reason that he's still leading, he's got a little passion going on yeah. that, that nobody else has got in the Republican Party. You're well, so right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So can that be fixed? It's I don't know. You know, you, you look at Jeb Bush's campaign, you look at his governor's record, and and, and it started with being governor of Florida. I have a house in Florida, and I've followed Florida politics. I've written about Jeb a lot. He was a fantastic governor. He talks about it all the time. Nobody cares. You know, it was, it was look, I, maybe they should care. You know, he left in 2006 uh, as governor of Florida, but they don't. He's got a, 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 a great tax plan. He's got a great regulatory relief plan. He's, he's put out an alternative to Obamacare. It, uh, uh, they don't get much attention and he doesn't really know how to promote them. He has personally run a very bad campaign. I mean, he has turned out to be, to my surprise, a, a very weak candidate, and then he's up against people. I mean, look, whether you like Trump or not, and Mort and I are not crazy about him, but he is a strong individual, would and he work, exudes that. Would it work if you changed his last name? No, I don't think that has anything to do with it, <laughs> a, a Bush's no. problem. It's, uh, he's just not a forceful candidate. Well, and, I, I de it definitely doesn't help him. Um, but, but Fred's right. I mean, it, it's just he. If you're if you're going to be what Ron did was break through to the public. He knew. You you look at those those videos. They're just dynamic. You know they 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 grab you and they knew how to he knew how to phrase things that that uh, that got into people's heads. I mean he got he he got his program through a Democratic Congress by going over the heads of the Congress to the American people. I used to say that, that, that Reagan has the magic of, of videons that go through the television screen and go directly into people's heads and convince them to write their congressman to do what, what he wants them to do. And, uh, you know, Jeb Bush doesn't seem to have it. And, and it's part of leadership. You've got to be yeah. able to get people excited. And... Um, you know, I, I would guess that it's going to boil down to the, the if you like, r r far right candidate or whatever. I don't know that Trump is, is actually even a conservative, but the, the anti establishment candidate will be somebody, Trump or Ben Carson or uh, Cruz or somebody like that, and there will be an establishment candidate, and it looks as though Marco Rubio is in the lead for that, for that position. Um, you know, and generally speaking, what the Republican Party does is it goes wandering through the wilderness, you know, at the far reaches of the frontier with Michelle Bachman and Herman Cain and <laughs> Pat Buchanan and Rick Perry and Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum. They all have their moment. Now, Trump has had a very long moment, a longer moment than any of those other people. Um, but, you know, now we have Ben Carson suddenly emerging in yeah, in Iowa, and but generally speaking, after it's over, the Republican Party ends up nominating its most electable candidate. Um, the only time it didn't do that was in 1964, and they got clobbered. I mean, the, the the most electable candidate doesn't always get elected. John McCain didn't, Bob Dole didn't, but at least they were in the ballpark. We have time so. for one last question. So, uh, if we could, uh, right here, yeah. 
What I'd like to know is how do you get truth in the press? I am so disgusted with all the lies that are being told today that I just, every time I look at, at the news, I want to puke. And what happens is that Ted Cruz told it like it is, Trump is telling it like it is, nobody well, wants to believe it. We live here in California where we are so in inundated with taxes and everything else because of all the illegals in this mm -hmm. state, with killings and, and with people being shot at and, and robbed and, and everything going on in this state and nobody wants to recognize it. Mm -hmm. And it, this is going on around the country with what's going on. How do we get truth in the press today? How do we, if it's between Trump and Hillary, what do you want, a liar? A person who because the election was coming up, as she put it, who cares? Four men, five men die in Benghazi, who cares? <laughs> okay, so your question is, yeah, uh, how do we get I'm, truth in the press? Yeah, don't how do we get truth in the okay, press thanks, the media? Thank you. Well, I'm glad you didn't sugarcoat it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, if I lived in California, I'd move. But uh, <laughs> I was about to say that. <laughs> That's the first thing I'd do, and I'd move. And, and there are lots of nice states to move to that don't have income taxes. You know, I, I own a house in Florida, but I don't, unfortunately I don't live there long enough every year so I can, I can take advantage of it. Now Mort and his wife Marguerite, uh, they do live in a state with no income tax. They now live in Seattle, so the state of Washington has, it, it, it has no income tax. You know, I, I, I wrote a piece in the New Republic when I went, when I went to the New Republic uh, magazine. I replaced a reporter who had, a writer who had left a to be the bureau chief for Newsweek. That was Mort. <laughs> and and I wrote a piece. following each other around for yeah. 40 years. We've been <laughs> friends a long, long time. And I wrote a piece about, this in the middle 80s, about media, I called it media realignment, how the media was finally moving away from liberal bias and so on. Well, as you could tell, as you can tell now, the piece was wrong because that hasn't happened. It's gotten worse than ever. The, 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 the worst example recently was just, I think, at the Benghazi hearings last Thursday. For instance, Jim Jordan uh, introduced two documents. One had, was an email from Hillary Clinton to her daughter uh, the evening of the Benghazi killing of Chris Stevens, the ambassador, and the three others that said this was an attack, the, the ambassador was killed, and this was an attack done by al-Qaeda. The next day, she's on the phone with the Egyptian, uh, uh, I guess it was the uh, prime minister, uh, telling him the same thing. That's not what she was saying in public, or Obama was saying in public. Uh, they were saying, oh, it was this video, this anti-Muslim video. She said that for two weeks. Obama said it for two weeks. They sent Susan Rice to go on five Sunday television shows and say it was this video. These documents show that Hillary knew better. Now, that's not my point, though. The point was, you read the Washington Post or the New York Times, and they each had one paragraph on it that you couldn't make out what, what it was about. Uh, it didn't draw the contrast. It didn't say, well, gee, these documents say one thing, but publicly she was saying uh, something else. She knew better. And they had a political reason for doing this, because the Obama administration was saying that al-Qaeda had been basically defeated. Remember their phrase was, on the run, uh, and they worried that that might uh, uh, flip the election against Obama. So they were out there blaming, they, they, they couldn't say it was al-Qaeda who killed the ambassador, they were out there blaming it on this video. And the, the mainstream media covered that up. Yeah. Fortunately, you've got choices, right? You can read the Wall Street Journal, which has, did, did not miss that story. Well, they right? sure didn't, yeah. Um, and uh, you've got the Weekly Standard, and you've got you know National Review, and you've got Fox News. Uh, but I do encourage you, I do encourage you to broaden to, to broaden your um, your sources. Right. The problem in America, part of the problem in America, is that all the people who are conservatives watch Fox News, and all the people who are liberals watch MSNBC. And they live in different information universes. I mean, it's not if if you I watch them both, and frankly, you get you know you could get bipolar um, <laughs> trying to do it. So I read you know lots of things, and you know I think it's worthwhile listening to National Public Radio, and I think it's worthwhile uh, um, 
you know, just reading a broad section of things to find out what other people are saying about things and making up your own mind about what, what reality is. Yeah, Before life's we, too yeah, life's too short for NPR, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you see, I'll bet you haven't listened to NPR in years. You're right, I haven't. Well, you're wrong. You're wrong. Your NPR is actually covers the world better than most than than the, the networks don't have any foreign correspondents anymore. Well, that's true. Yeah, but NPR does. NPR's got the Kluge money, and you know, and they're and they they fan, they fan the world and. Generally speaking, you know where there's trouble as a result. Well, before Try we, it. Before Try we it say, uh, <laughs> before we give our guests a really well-deserved round of applause, I just want to invite everyone to stick around afterwards where both Fred and Mort will be signing their book on Jack Kemp. And as we were talking before the event this evening, this is the only biography that exists on Jack Kemp, and it's therefore the best. Uh, By far. Uh, but but I, I, I can assure you these gentlemen, uh, these, these gentlemen were part of the very fabric of what made politics what it was during the Kemp era and they know their subject matter about Jack Kemp better than any other uh, living American. So let me just say I, it's just been an honor to have both of you here and we really truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.